Hello, Andrew, who I know we're not going to call you Andrew Ross. You can. You're if you, Andrew you can call me to whatever your friends you like. on the radio. Okay. So let's talk about Billions. This show, there's some big characters played, as I mentioned, by some big actors. How colorful are the real life characters on Wall Street? Oh, I think the, co- the characters on Wall Street, frankly, just as colorful. Uh, I don't want to say more so. I think I think the show itself is pretty dramatic unto itself. But I always enjoyed, as a journalist, covering the world of Wall Street, not so much because of the sort of big numbers and these big institutions that we always think about, but because it's a human drama. And there are these remarkably rich, over-the-top characters. It's about the people. And to the extent that we've been able to draw on that and that ethos and infuse it inside of the show Billions... That's what we've tried to do. So how did you do that? Did you take specific, was it a composite of characters? Did you take lines that you remember? Do you, what do you bring from your observations as a reporter to these specific scripts? I think, you know, my contribution, and I co-created the show with Brian Koppelman and Dave Levine, who, by the way, I have learned they are the, I mean, I've learned at their feet. They are, they are masters in this business. They wrote Ocean's 13. They did Rounders. The goal for me really was to try to take what I've learned as a reporter and to to bring it into this. I wouldn't tell you that Bobby Axelrod is one specific individual on Wall Street or one specific hedge fund manager, but there are elements of all sorts of different people and characteristics and things. And as we prepared for the show, when Damian Lewis came to New York, you know, Damian and I, we went out. And we spent time with hedge fund managers and we went to dinner with them and lunch with them and really tried to get at who these people are and importantly, what drives them. I think one of the things that's so important about what we've tried to do in this show is get at the power and the money. And what is this about? What is it about? What's, why are you a billionaire? How did you get to be a billionaire? You know, when you made your first hundred million dollars, you know, was that not enough? Why didn't you like what 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 was it that I made you say, okay, I got to I got to keep going here? <laughs> right. And uh, that's that's a large part of what this story, in some way, is about. It's about what drives these people. You know, is it about the money? Is it about the power? Is it about the influence? Is it about the is it a pride thing? Is it about a scorecard? And that's that's what Billions, beyond what is a fun and dramatic story, but embedded in there is that story. Well, and what about, I'm curious about how they see themselves, these Wall Street CEOs. Because, I mean, as we've said, 2008 led to some pretty bad press. Right. Uh, how did the characters, not in your show, but right. the people in, in Wall Street that you report on, how do they see themselves these days? Well, two things. You know, when I wrote that book, Too Big to Fail, the title was a play on two things. It was this idea that the firms were too big to fail, potentially, or not. But it was also a play on the idea of the psyches of the people at the top, which is to say that they believed that they were too big to fail. And I would contend today that that has not changed, that sort of psychological profile of somebody who doesn't even fathom the possibility of failure. You know, most people in Wall Street effectively are professional optimists right? They're professional optimists. They have to be. They have to believe that things are going to go up. There are those, by the way, that are bearish and they think that things can go down. But for the most part, they, they believe in, uh, in, in the sort of upward trend. But I think there's two types of success. You know, the American dream has almost become bifurcated. There's this American dream that anybody can, you know, almost win the lottery, almost, uh, you know, and, and make something in their garage and have outsized success, so Steve Jobs in success, or Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook success, or maybe even Bobby Axelrod-like success. There's that success. And when I say success, these billion-dollar numbers. But then there's also um, the the other American dream is what I call the leave it to beaver American dream, which was the idea that if you just worked hard and you played by the rules and you tried, things were going to work out. And to some degree, that American dream is the one that's challenged today. I want to ask you about the way that you that you work as a financial reporter. I mean, the relationships that give you your inside edge. Right. How do you also maintain the ability to stand back and observe? I mean, you, you, you right. cultivated these relationships right. that allowed you to to write Too Big to Fail and, and to have the success that you have as, as the financial right. reporter. But how do you maintain your objectivity and your ability to say what you need to say? Well, I think that's, 
that's probably the hardest thing that I do every day, um, which is to say to try to maintain that perspective. And uh, I do know all these people. Um, I cover them, but I cover them like any other journalist. Uh, they're not my friends. Um, but I care about the nuance. I care about the nuance. What do you mean? And it To me, when it came to Too Big to Fail or frankly anything that I'm working on, I want to get inside the room. I want to know the subject of that story. I want to know that su the subject of that story inside and out so that I can tell the story with the proper authenticity and nuance. This is not in the fictional setting. This is in the nonfiction setting. And, you know, does that mean you get to know the person? Absolutely. Um, does that mean that you are nicer or easier on them than you would otherwise be? I would argue absolutely not. In fact, I think oftentimes when you get inside the room, you can see and find out things that are terrible and bring those to light. The, the only thing that I would say that I think I do do, or that I try to do at least, is to be fair. I think fairness matters. And so if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna hit you over the head with a two by four, I'm gonna call you up and I'm gonna say, look, you know, I'm writing a column tomorrow and you're gonna hate this column. This is not gonna be a good morning for you. Tell me every reason why I'm wrong. I'm happy to include that information in the article. I actually think it makes it a stronger piece. You do this when, when you're oh, going to take somebody down. And, and by the way, I think that it, to the extent you, you know, to the extent you're talking about relationships, I actually think that matters. I've actually, for the most part, even when I've written terribly critical, horrible stories about people, to some degree, I've, I mean, look, there's certain people that don't want to talk to you anymore, but. I think that I've maintained a, a relationship with, with a lot of these people in part because it just, I've tried to be fair with them. Um, and we don't, haven't always agreed on the outcome. Oftentimes we don't agree on the outcome. But, you know. Well, and I read that people continue to talk to you and give you, know, you inf inside information on Wall Street because you're the guy that everybody else is talking to. So I, it occurs to me the title of your book, Too Big to Fail, could apply to you I don't because know about you've become me, so, but... too connected to be cut off. Well, no, I, look, the other piece of it, and I'm, I, maybe I'm in a privileged and lucky place in this way, is that having now covered this world for as long as I have, I do know a lot of these individuals, and there is a sense that. I learn things and know stuff, and so then other people may be more inclined to talk to you. By the way, I would say also in a post-too-big-to-fail world or even working on certain things, there are people who don't want to talk to you. I mean, I have, there's a lot of people who don't want to take the phone call. So it's not, um, it's, you know, it's not a fait accompli. In terms of the way that you address, that's sort of your nonfiction, that's your a journalism non work. That's nonfiction work. And we're flip-flopping back right. and forth um, sure. here to talk about you know, the, the way you portray those characters and their actions in, in fiction, in right. billions, I want to know how you approach the issue of morality. Because, you know, Martin Scorsese came in for some criticism for taking glee in the amorality of the traitors in Wolf of Wall Street. Right. So what kinds of conversations do you have or what are your thoughts on approaching the issue of morality in Billions? Well, I think morality is central to the theme of what Billions is all about. And when you think about these two larger-than-life characters in Bobby Axelrod, played by, by Damien, who runs an impossibly successful hedge fund, if you will, and impossibly successful for probably the wrong reasons. Um, and on the other side, you have Paul Giamatti, who plays the lead prosecutor for white collar crime in the United States. And by the way, you would think that he's the hero of the story in many respects, and he's the one working for the public good, but he will do awful things in the name of doing right. Meanwhile, the person who you might think is the villain in the story in Damien will do terrible things, yes, but there are also these unique and somewhat fascinating um, elements to him about his loyalty um, in his marriage, certain things in his family, in his background that I think are actually quite redeemable. And I think the whole goal of this project to some degree is, you know, is to play with this idea of black and white. We, we have these very preconceived notions of who is the good guy and who's the bad guy, but when you get in the room, it is always gray. And, you know, Brian and David and I, I think we would all say, you know, our hope as you're watching this show over these 12 episodes is there will be times where you will love Bobby and little times you'll hate Bobby. And there'll be times where you'll love Chuck and be rooting for Chuck. And there'll be times you'll be hating on Chuck. And, and, and that's, you know, but that's life. I know the show got screened for employees at Goldman Sachs. What was their reaction? That's actually, that's happening today. Oh, it's today. It's today. I'm missing it. Ugh. I'm missing it. 
So I don't know. Wouldn't, love, wouldn't you love to be I a would, fly on that I'd love wall? To, I'd love to be on the fly on the, on the wall. We've gotten, I mean, it's interesting. We have had people in the business, hedge fund managers, all sorts of people all over Wall Street who have who have seen the show. And I've uh, happily, the reaction has been uh, positive. Some people, you know, love the show. Some people, you know, are now already, you know, giving us new ideas about what should be in the show. Um, and I imagine there'll be some people who may not like the show, which is fine, too. Uh, this is Q. I'm speaking with Andrew Ross Sorkin. He's co-creator and an executive producer for the new TV show Billions. It premieres this weekend on Crave TV in Canada and Showtime in the U.S. You talk about Paul Giamatti's character. He's government government attorney, right. goes after financial crimes. He's got close relatives in the show, his wife, his father, right. who are in the business world. Is that kind of murkiness something you've seen in real life? Oh, it's absolutely born in real life. Um, I could point to certain people. I, I will spare them that. But, you know, one of the things we wanted to play with was the conflict that and the role at, at in that in that space. When you are the lead prosecutor for this, you have an enor enormous amount of power. I mean, just tremendous power to bring a case against somebody is a huge power. And by the way, we talked to certain prosecutors when we were researching this project who will tell you that actually the biggest power that they have is the decision not to bring a case. That literally the decision not to is sort of almost almost as important as... Why the, is that? Paul Giamatti's character says that in the show. Why is that? Because you can change somebody's life forever if you bring... If, the second you decide that you are going as a prosecutor to publicly go after another individual, that is a life-changing event. And that is a huge power for one individual to have. To make or not and make. And in this particular instance, in Chuck or uh, in Giamatti's world, you know, his wife, Wendy, is gives him, has creates this huge conflict for him because she has been working with Bobby Axelrod, with Damien, since, uh, we haven't got to it, but before 9-11. And so there is, a, there is a relationship there. And what do you do when that happens? And by the way, there have been instances where prosecutors and other people in government have spouses who happen to be in businesses that, mm. and it really gets at the revolving door of Washington as well. And then we have a father, he comes from money. Giamatti's character in this story comes from money. And he has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder about all of that. And his father has his own views on what Chuck should be doing. No, you definitely get at that murkiness. And you mentioned the revolving door. In Washington, there's certainly been criticism around the, evol the, right. the revolving door. And Wall Street, that was supposed to change after 2008. Right. Did it? It absolutely didn't. I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> I had a Pre feeling you were going to say that. Preet Bharara, by the way, who is the... Current, who's currently serving in the role, in the real life role of the one that Paul Giamatti plays in this story, uh, prosecuting white collar crime, his deputy just left the office to go work for one of the largest, most influential billionaire hedge fund managers in America. So this revolving door between Wall Street and Washington, uh, or po the political element or even the justice element, has not changed uh, one iota. Has has the risk changed on Wall Street? I would say yes. One thing I will say is that the big Wall Street banks, in fact, I think we've we've sort of lost our focus on what's where the real risk is. The Wall Street banks actually have changed. The risk inside the big banks is not where I would be worried about. What's happened is because the regulators have regulated these banks, all of the riskiest stuff is now actually going on inside the equivalent of hedge funds. It's not that Goldman Sachs just shut down its arbitrage desk, which was uh, one of the sort of riskier investment uh, elements of what they were doing. It's not that the desk went away. The desk now works at another firm called KKR that's not regulated. And so there's this whole almost shadow banking system that's developed over the past four or five years. And I don't think anybody's paying attention to it. We're still, we're still, we're, we're so rear view mirror on what's happened here. I also have to ask you about something we are paying a lot of attention to, which yeah. is Donald Trump, New York billionaire, right. running for president. Do financial people see Donald Trump as, as one of them? For the most part, no. I've been fascinated by, by the Donald for many reasons. We're all fascinated by the Donald. I, but of course, I've been fascinated by his ascent. The thing that's so interesting to me is, you know, six months ago, if you were to talk to a businessman, CEO, someone of prominence in the business world, 
they would have been very quick to dismiss Donald. They would say, ah, Joker, uh, disgrace to the party, all, you know, a, a lot of that. Today, because all of a sudden it looks like he has a chance, it's very hard to find people who will say that publicly. Um, I don't know if that's because they think that he's going to start a Twitter war with them. I don't know if it's because they think that if he actually becomes the president, he will hold grudges, which, of course, he does. I'm not sure what that's about. But there has definitely been a shift, not necessarily in what the business world thinks about Donald Trump, but how outspoken uh, they might otherwise be about it. By the way, that's not to say there are certain business people, and I've been – maybe I'm surprised to say this. There have been business people that I know who know Donald Trump who – support him and like him and actually think that he'd be a, a very good leader. Um, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with that, but that's the that's what's going on. All right. Well, if he's sort of the intersection of, of financial, the financial world, the political world and pop culture, you could say, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the moment that Wall Street is having in pop culture. I mentioned right. uh, the success of The Big Short yep. with all these Oscar nominations, your show Billions. Why do you think audiences are so interested in a world that can be pretty dense and complex and a lot of us might not even really think we understand, but yet we still want to know what's going on. Why, well, to me, the financial crisis plays a huge role in all of this and our interest was peaked. Frankly, I don't think anybody was paying attention or not paying attention enough uh, prior to the crisis, clearly. Clearly. And, you know, all of our lives really were impacted in a meaningful way by this crisis. And so I think a lot of people said, oh, what is what is this thing all about? I want to understand it. So I think there's an understanding piece of it. But I also would say as a storyteller and someone who's covered this world for a long time, there really are great stories here. <laughs> and they're they're really rich. As I said before, the, the, cal- the, the, the characters are colorful. And I also think people are starting to appreciate more and more that if you follow the money, it explains a lot of things in the world. It's not just about Wall Street. You're seeing it seep over, as you said, into politics, and you're seeing the influence of money in politics. You know, we watch sports, and you see people get traded or th- certain things happen. It's about the money. And even in the world of arts, it's about the money. And I think we have a collective fascination with some of these people, some of it because we think it's out of our grasp and we don't understand it or some people aspire to it or what have you but also because it explains where we are in the world to a large degree. I'm just thinking of a lot of artists listening who might say, no, 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 no. arts isn't about the money. Arts explains where we are in the world. That's. I would like to think that's the case, but I would also tell you, having now uh, worked on a, a series where I understand you know, the benefit of tax credits uh, for doing a, doing a show in a certain place, there is a, there's a money element. It explains a lot about certain decisions that get made when you really try to get down to the heart Part of it. How big's the budget? How's you know there 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 is a money com- piece to everything uh, that we do, and it it influences a lot of things. So your work in you still got these two hats. Yep. You still got the journalism nonfiction yep. side of your work. You got billions uh, and the yeah. fictional side. Which do you like better? Which is more fun? Not that it's an unfair question, but an unsatisfying answer. I love both, and they influence each other. I mean. So much, so much of what we've been able to do in Billions and and what I hope I've been able to contribute to the project has been bringing that ethos and bringing uh, what I've learned over the years into it. And it sort of helped develop some of those storylines and arcs. And meanwhile, I've learned a lot about storytelling through this process in the fictional world in terms of what makes a great story. And even when I now think about writing my column, uh, not to fictionalize the column, by the way, but in terms of what's going to hook people and how to... How the to, elements how, of how to tell a the story. The elements of... And I've learned so much from, from David and Brian about storytelling and spending time with Neil Berger, our director, who directed The Illusionist and, you know, did the Divergent and, and Limitless, even just even just understanding how to how to tell that on a big screen and bring that in you know, I've always thought of this as a storyteller. My job ultimately is being a storyteller and telling the human drama. I, I used to think I, I used to go to a, cover white collar trials, white collar cases, and I was supposed to ostensibly be there to cover the trial and the case. But I was always as fascinated, if not more so, by the family sitting behind the defendant, who is usually an executive, maybe even a hedge fund manager, and the dynamic between the family. And the defendant at this great moment of tension, 
And I was, I would always be looking over there, even when someone was on the stand. So to be able to sort of tell the, to be able to tell the world about money and business, but through this sort of human drama and characters, really, you know, my, been my goal. Yeah, you're at a really interesting intersection. It's uh, you've got a neat gig. Thank you for t- Thank telling you for us having about me. it. Really appreciate it.